Bandan, uh, Kwasa Kanesi Bau, good afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us from your offices, home offices, kitchens, bedrooms, and lounges uh, to attend Museums and Tech 2021. It's great to see you all attend today and tomorrow from across the four nations of the UK and around the world. Uh, my name's uh, David James, I'm the head of digital at Angela Cymru National Museum Wales, and I'm also chair for the UK's Museums Computer Group. Um, I'm being joined by Georgina. Sarah, if you can put Georgina on the stage, please. Great. Uh, I'm Georgina, Treasurer of Museums Computer Group. So you might have heard of me if you purchased a corporate membership this year. I'm also a content strategist at One Father, who we'll be hearing more of in the opening keynote. The Museums Computer Group is a non-profit association of individuals who share a common interest in supporting best practice in the use of technology within the museum and heritage sector. And this is the second year of our conference, Museums in Tech, being conducted online. And we've seen how our digital spaces are now central to our activities. Museums have now foregrounded that technology in their thinking. Our digital roadmaps have been prioritised by a pandemic. And throughout COVID, there's been some really innovative work in the sector. Some have also taken the opportunity to prior prioritise some well-needed core improvements. Our digital skills, our digital literacy, our infrastructure, all whilst ensuring that our practice is centred around societal impact and outcomes. I'd like to give thanks to the corporate members who not only help sustain the Museums Computer Group, but also enable us to set a pay what you can model to ensure that the community can remain engaged with our conference. And you'll see some of the sponsors around me now. I'm grateful for being part of the sector that is so supportive across our different organisations, agencies and companies. And Museums of Tech, as usual, has been put together by a team of volunteers that, quite frankly, have other things they could be doing. Um, they deserve a huge amount of credit. I am, like everyone else here today, grateful for the committee members. Before I pass on to Georgina, I've got some housekeeping to cover. So our talks will be captioned by our partners, Stage Text and My Clear Text. Hopefully you manage to find access if you need it. Keynotes and sessions will happen here on the main stage. Uh, for the Q&As, uh, use the chat, please, not the Q&A function. But it, feel free to introduce yourself as well and then ask a question. And there are two chat modes, one on the stage and then one for the general conference. The hashtag is MuseTech2021 and our Twitter handle is at UKMCG. So make sure you positively engage with peers and friends to share and discuss. And we want to encourage robust conversation, uh, but this is a safe space. So use your judgment. Please see our code of conduct. We'll post that in the chat. Uh, we're keen to hear from new voices within the sector, so please make sure that you join the conversation um, and make, make the most of the networking tools in Hopin as well, which will be in the session section. Brilliant. Thanks, Daph. So this year, we've structured the theme of the conference around data. We are really pleased to receive submissions from across the MCG community. In today's conference sessions, we'll look at data in the context of connecting the general public with museum content, whereas tomorrow's sessions will focus more on data in a collections context. The key questions we'll be asking over the course of the conference are, how is our sector using its data? What insights has it brought to our work? And what does this mean for those who run museums and those who visit them? So kicking off proceedings today is Chris Unit, founder and CEO of One Further, a data analytics and content strategy agency based in the cultural sector. The title of Chris's talk is Museum Data from Collection to Action. He'll be looking at the difference between the promise of data, so making museums more effective, telling the stories of collections, understanding the needs of audiences, and the reality that finding meaning from data is not straightforward or easy. Chris will lead his insights from his experience of, as he puts it, finding value among the rows and columns, as well as practical ways to weave data into day-to-day -day activities and inform organisational strategy. Chris will talk for about half an hour, so until around 2.15, and there will then be 15 minutes at the end for questions. Please put questions in the chat as and when they come up, and we'll get through as many as we can from 2.15 to 2.30. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hi there, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, Georgina. And thanks very much for having me today. It's um, uh, really quite the honor to be asked to go up first and talk to you about uh, all of this and set some of the, set the stage for what you're going to be listening to um, and seeing over the next couple of days. <clears throat> so as Georgina, Georgina said, my name is Chris Unit. Uh, if you want to heckle me on uh, Twitter as well as during the, in the comments during this, I'm at Chris Unit uh, on there. Uh, but I won't be paying attention, so say what you like. What I'm going to talk about, about today was uh, brilliantly set up by Georgina. We're going to look at um, some of the difficulties that the sector is experiencing around its use of data, and we're going to look at some of the some of the ways that we can try and mitigate some of that, and uh, try and get past, uh, get over those hurdles, and uh, and make some sense of uh, how people are engaging with uh, with us uh, online. So uh, I should also say that the uh, the images that some of the images that are, I've uh, popped into this have been created by an, uh, a neural network. Um, I'll uh, tweet a link out to uh, who it was that um, that put this uh, online free online tool together. So um, the the promise of data is really quite a compelling one. There's uh, there's all sorts of promise there around how we can use uh, use the numbers, use the feedback from uh, from audiences and uh, others to find out um, what we should be doing, yeah. essentially, um, to answer the kind of questions that come up in our day to day that plague us around things like uh, how much should we be charging for an exhibition? How are we going to find audiences that uh, that um, uh, that aren't coming and visiting us at the moment. What should I be writing on our website next? What should we be acquiring for our collections? There's a sense out there. There's a bit of uh, data optimism uh, out there in the ether that there are that the answers are out there. It's just a question of getting the right numbers and interrogating it in the right way, and uh, and that will lead us to uh, to understand what we're meant to be uh, what we're meant to be doing. The reality is always going to be a lot messier than that. And it's not quite so straightforward. So what I'm gonna talk through today is um, uh, just having a very clear, clear eyed view of what some of those challenges are. And then hopefully some little tips and tricks for, for getting through them to make our day-to-day -day work that little bit more easier. And then start to influence how we're uh, working at an organizational level as well and setting the, setting the standard and the direction from there. So first of all, I mean, I don't want to harp on about this for, for too long, but um, there are all sorts of obstacles that are put in the way of the museum sector when it comes to making use of data. Some of these are very well documented, uh, so I won't go over these uh, too much. Firstly, there's, there's an issue of resource. The uh, Digital Culture 2019 report by Nesta um, uh, highlighted that among museums, the, the biggest issue is the lack of in-house staff time. And that is across all types of digital activity, not just uh, not just data, but that's one of the realities that we're working in uh, within. We just don't have time for um, uh, to dedicate to all the activities that we would like to do. The second issue is another one that centers on, uh, on people, and it's to do with the, the skills. This came from um, uh, Dr. James and uh, Carty Price's um, paper, Structuring for Digital Success, where they asked people um, how, uh, how they were making use of digital within their organizations and what they saw as uh, most important and where they saw uh, gaps in what they were doing. And one of the, one of the key findings for this was that um, uh, GLAMs are operating within an increasingly data-driven world, yet are not investing in the data skills they so clearly need. And it's problematic getting those skills in-house. I could, uh, I know of at least three national institutions in the past six months that have tried and not been successful in recruiting digital analysts to work um, in their teams. Uh, there aren't many people with the um, with the requisite skills, and the ones that are out there tend to be quite expensive. So, uh, so museums are, are competing for uh, for skilled individuals and digital specialists across the board in terms of data analytics. 
there are hedge funds that are going to pay a lot more money for a digital analyst than a museum is ever going to be able to uh, to afford. So that's one of the things we're working. There's a bunch of other things that are uh, that make this difficult as well. So first of all, museums are incredibly complicated organisations. Uh, I remember talking to a, a software supplier. They sell some uh, analytics tooling. They said, oh, so the clients you work with, what do their websites do? Is it uh, is it e-commerce retail or um, um, like membership sites or are they um, content publishers? And the answer is all of them. Uh, a museum website is going to sell uh, tickets and merchandise, going to take donations. So there's a charitable and um, uh, fundraising aspect uh, to it. They're going to be um, running a subscription model with memberships uh, potentially. And um, anyone who's putting their, uh, their collection online and also publishing uh, research and articles uh, and blog content and what have you is also in the business of being a content publisher as well, which just comes with another set of things that could, should be measured, optimized. So getting to grips with just one of those business models um, or one of those programs of activity is complicated enough. Trying to do all of it is yeah, just even more difficult. Museums are odd organizations as well, in the sense that they're not like many of the commercial organizations that uh, data and analytics tools are traditionally uh, deployed in the service of. So being mission-driven organizations, there's all sorts of considerations you've got to think about in terms of um, uh, the decision making that you're um, that you're using the data for. Uh, we can't just monetize everything. Some collections are, are being held for the uh, for the public at large. Um, there's a um, a responsibility to increase access to things and not paywall things. As much as that might help with data collection and uh, subscription revenue products. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons why uh, a museum might not just chase page views, for example, and publish uh, huge, broadly um, uh, broadly popular types of content and ignore the niche, the specialist, because their role encompasses all of these things. So just chasing numbers is never going to be something that a museum is uh, going to be able to focus on to the exclusion of everything else. There's always going to be a little bit of uh, fuzziness in there, and that needs to be taken into account. It is true that some of the tools are complicated and there's a learning curve to using something like, I mean, pick uh, Google Tag Manager, for example, um, uh, or Google Analytics, which I'm sure most people, uh, most museums are, are going to be using at this point. There is a bit of difficulty with uh, with using the tools and understanding the jargon and the, uh, the possibilities of each tool. <clears throat> And something that I'll come on to in a, um, a little bit later as well is it's not enough just to be able to see that uh, a certain page on your website gets a certain amount of traffic. Um, uh, you need to understand the whys and wherefores of things and understand that, OK, so a page on our website might have got 100,000 page views in the past uh, week. But understanding how that fits into the wider ecology of the museum and what that's valuable for requires an understanding of uh, the museum as, uh, as an organization itself. It's quite difficult to jump into the museum sector and just understand everything from the get go, understand the possibilities, what's, um, what, what's, what's normal. And so being able to have that depth of understanding that you can, uh, that sits beneath any analysis you're doing is, is necessary as well. And the other thing is, um, so I'm not in all cases uh, uh, a complete evangelist for uh, data and evaluation. There are cases, uh, especially when resource is lacking, that you just need to get on and do stuff and execution, even if it's probably not in the right, uh, uh, the right direction, you need to get on and do something. And this is one of the things that I see organizations stumbling over quite a bit is what is the value of doing this, um, doing evaluation and analysis? And really how much further is it going to push us forward? Is it worth 
um, uh, a relatively small team investing in analytics tools and processes and staff on the understanding that it will unlock some opportunities, benefits, cost savings later on. That's a really hard, uh, really hard thing to understand. Uh, I think that the um, uh, I think that the return on investment of evaluation and analysis uh, kicks in at a slightly um, uh, lower level than some might expect. Uh, it tends to be only our largest institutions that really invest in um, uh, in-house digital analytics uh, skills. I think it can benefit those um, that are working with uh, uh, with less resource as well. But it's unclear and it's a challenge to understand exactly what you're doing, especially when all of the activities that a museum is doing are not revenue driving. Um, and so it's harder to say we spend X on this, we get back Y uh, and that we will have will increase our conversion rates um, uh, and our revenue such that we will cover the cost of these things it just doesn't really work like that. So it's complicated, it's really difficult and um, uh, but I don't think it's worth being despondent about this particularly. There are things that we can do to improve the day to day and to help inform uh, organisational activity and strategy more broadly. One thing before I dive into things, just want to just be clear on what we're talking about when we're talking about data, because there's all sorts of different things that um, that are encompassed within that. It's a bit like talking about digital these days. Digital is um, uh, it's a useful catch-all, but it once you start getting into the specifics, there are uh, the devil really is in the detail. So in terms of the data, the I mean, this conference has been set up uh, quite nicely so that uh, on the first day, we're mostly talking about data that tells you what's happening in terms of uh, user engagement, user experience, and the impact that your activities have uh, is having. And then tomorrow, a lot of the talks are around data as an asset that you can do things with. So your collections data, uh, your program data, and that um, can be used as a um, uh, uh, used as a uh, a thing. Um, the neural network generated images that I've used in this, they're using data to create artworks um, uh, through that uh, through that AI process. What I'm going to be talking about here, and most people today are going to be talking about data that helps to inform what's happening uh, with your activity and giving you that kind of uh, insight and context. Within that, you can chunk it up. Uh, so we've got a uh, collection and program uh, data. So um, <clears throat> the collection data is mostly going to be uh, the information about the uh, objects and collections that you uh, that you have. Uh, but also how people are interacting with those as well. With the program data, it's how many people and who are the people who are interacting with you. Uh, the column in the middle here is uh, tends to be back office data, so understanding how much people are um, uh, how much people are uh, spending with you, what products they're buying from the shop, uh, understanding the traffic sources to your website, uh, and so on. And then there's the third part of it which is, uh, it's not owned data within a museum context, but it's uh, societal data. And it's the kind of thing that some people are doing some interesting research on, trying to understand what the, what the activity of a museum is having on that wider societal uh, uh, data, things like well-being, health uh, indicators, and so on. Me, for the work that, uh, that I tend to do, I mostly do, do uh, digital analytics work which um, tends to be split between uh, audience analytics. So that's understanding who are the people who are engaging with your website, with your social media, uh, who you're reaching um, with any of the digital activity that you might be doing, no matter what the platform. Uh, marketing analytics, which is understanding how people are coming to your website. And so that's going to be using tools like Google Analytics, but also if you're using um, uh, Facebook ads or Google ads, then understanding how to uh, how those how those are working, how campaigns can be optimized. Product analytics is understanding; it, it tends to be understood as understanding uh, user behavior on a website, and so that is understanding what features are people using, what pages are they looking at, 
uh, where are they hitting errors, stumbling blocks, especially within uh, any purchase pathways. And then the content analytics side of things, which is taking a publisher's view of the work that you're doing and understanding not just page views, because understanding page views is fine, but going deeper than that and understanding that for a given article, how many people, um, uh, what percentage of people tend to uh, complete that article and finish reading it or uh, sign up to your mailing list as a result of reading that article or are uh, encouraged to go and click on something else and recirculate within your website. So each of these uh, have slightly different uh, considerations involved in them. And what we're trying to find out is when we're, when we're doing our analysis, uh, there's different extents to which you can do it. Now, the starting point is to uh, is what's known as descriptive analytics. And so that's understanding what happened, uh, what happened in the past. Um, how many people came to your website in November, for example. The next stage of that is diagnostic analytics. And so that's understanding why. Why was it that number in November? So that's where we start to layer a little bit of uh, insight on things. In my experience, most people are reasonably good at the descriptive side of things. The diagnostic can sometimes get tricky, but that's where people really start to uh, improve their understanding of their analytics. Where it gets really interesting, though, is when we start to look at um, uh, predictive analytics, which is um, not as complicated as it might seem, but it's about thinking um, what is going to happen in December. So if we knew how many people came to our website in November, what's that going to be in December? So we can look back a, a year. I mean, probably not the best year to look back and do year on year analysis, but uh, we can look back and uh, understand the trends and say, what, what are we likely to see um, uh, in the next month? And then prescriptive analytics, that's where it gets really exciting, um, if you're into that kind of thing. And that's trying to figure out how we can influence, knowing what we know and what we've built up from our existing knowledge, what uh, what is going, um, knowing what's likely to happen, how can we then have an influence on that? You can think about this in, some, in a uh, pyramid. So the what happened is the descriptive analytics. You need to have a good understanding of uh, what happened because it's useful to know where you're, where you're coming from. The why did that happen is uh, diagnostic. So understanding the, uh, the whys. Um, so that's, that's that additional layer of insight. Knowing what's going to happen as a result of these things puts you in a position to, uh, uh, to, uh, to start doing a bit of uh, forward planning. And the really valuable thing is this, what should we do? Uh, to understand uh, where your activity and uh, effort is going to be best placed. That's the bit that we don't see too many organisations uh, thinking ahead, but that's when organisations are starting to make targets for their, uh, for their activity and understanding that the activity that they do can have an effect and uh, they can start to make some sort of estimates for what that's going to be. So that was all kind of scene setting. What I want to do now is, uh, and was promised in the blurb for this talk, is to talk about some of the practical steps that you can take to overcome some of the challenges that I was talking about. And to think about that in terms of the day to day and to think about that in terms of wider organisational uh, strategy. So start with improving the day to day. To get the bottom of your pyramid started, you need to have good foundations of data. Uh, one of the worst things I ever see is I go into organisations that uh, that have lost all faith in the data that they're uh, collecting. So they might have a something might have gone wrong with their Google Analytics uh, data. Uh, they got questioned on it in a board meeting, and now no one trusts the numbers anymore, and that's sad. So one of the things is just to make sure that you're collecting the right data and uh, and that that data is robust, because if you haven't got that, then it's very hard to do the decision making uh, on top of it. So for this kind of thing, uh, so Logo Soup, I apologize for, but um, uh, using Google Tag Manager to add tags to your website, 
using Google Analytics and configuring it so that you're doing slightly more than just the out of the box, collecting the number of page views that people are seeing, but you're also making sure that if you're doing any, uh, so if you have downloads of resources, you're able to count how many uh, teachers resources have been downloaded. Uh, that you're doing, um, that if you're using Google Ads and Facebook Ads, then you're sending conversion data to those so that you can really optimize your uh, your campaigns uh, properly. Um, the two logos on the uh, on the right hand side, or the icons, uh, one is Hotjar, which is a tool for qualitative feedback, uh, for doing little pop up surveys and heat maps on pages, which uh, should probably be a part of um, uh, most museums uh, toolkit. Uh, and in the bottom right hand corner, it's an icon for uh, just uh, fairly standard uh, usability testing, sitting down with someone, asking them to find your exhibition page and asking what they think about it and trying to book a ticket and seeing if that's uh, possible for them or if they uh, stumble at all. So having the, I mean, that's not really a tool so much, uh, it's a process, but having the processes in, in place and actually using these tools and checking monthly, you know, every six months if it's, um, but having a, a process through which you just uh, check the numbers and become more familiar with them. Uh, the government digital service do or did this thing where uh, people had to watch uh, usability testing with proper users um, uh, at least every couple of months or so. And if they didn't, then their opinions on what happened on the website were entirely invalid because they weren't, uh, they, they were just going off anecdote rather than finding out the uh, how actual users were, were doing things. So having some sort of process, it doesn't really need to be, it doesn't need to be complicated at all, but just knowing that every uh, uh, every couple of weeks, couple of months, depending on the rhythms of your particular organization, the amount of resource that you've got, that you're uh, checking in on your numbers and uh, or doing some sort of uh, test or collecting some feedback from people. And then the, um, the third part of this is setting up some regular reporting. Doesn't need to be complicated, um, again, but just having something that will tell you uh, how many views your, the content that you've been producing over the past couple of months, how many people have looked at that, uh, uh, how are people getting to your exhibition pages? It's the kind of thing that you can set up and most of the tools will send you a report every week or month or whatever, so you don't even have to go into the tools to, uh, to find these things. So getting that foundational stuff sorted, um, there are loads of guides online for doing this kind of thing. It's that this is the bit that if you're going to get anyone in to come and help you with this stuff, get them to do, get them, get your foundation sorted so that you can then just make use of it uh, ongoing. You might not need the skills in house to uh, because you only need to set these things up once. And then after that. And just really start small with things. So like I was saying, just know your numbers, make sure you've got that foundational thing of understanding um, how many people tend to come to your website, where they tend to come to your website from, uh, and what kind of content they tend to uh, look at. Once you get in the habit of looking at these things, then it just builds up a bit of muscle memory. And it means that you can spot the anomalies and the changes and the spikes uh, a bit more. Uh, it might be worth getting some training. Uh, you can either pay for that or um, you can go to uh, organizations that provide that kind of training. The Arts Marketing Association do uh, provide a lot of uh, uh, a lot of quite specific training around this kind of thing, if you're a member of them. Uh, but there are there's all sorts of stuff on YouTube, frankly, uh, to uh, to improve your your basic analytics skills. Uh, if I was going to recommend anything, then I would recommend uh, getting some training on how to present data, because uh, that's really going to uh, going to help you kind of spread the word within an organisation. And I'd also, on the scale of starting small, I I would get in the habit of doing quick checks on data. So if you're writing an article on Roman sandals, for example. 
then do the job of just checking really quickly. You don't need to do, you don't need to have expensive search engine optimization software to check uh, what Google says people usually ask on that topic. I've typed in Roman sandals and it's told me that people also ask what are Roman sandals called? Why did Roman soldiers wear sandals? Did the Romans make sandals? That sounds like subheadings on the article that I'm planning to make sure that I've got that kind of thing because I understand that people are, that's what people are searching about. All that stuff's underpinned by data um, and it's just there for you to, uh, to make use of. So there are other areas where you might want to do these little verifications, little, uh, little checks to find out um, how you can just make small incremental improvements to the stuff that you're already doing. So on top of that, it's really useful to have other people to talk about this kind of thing. I mean, congratulations, you are, you've come to a museum computer group uh, event. There is, um, uh, there's a great uh, email list where people are constantly asking uh, questions uh, and helping each other out. But one of the things I love about working with mu the museum sector is that it is so sharing and collaborative. So, um, Get involved in that. There are people out there who will help. The Museum Computer Network over in the States has a special interest group for data and insight. So if this is becoming an increasingly large part of your job, then uh, that's um, uh, that's something else that you could join. But also look outside of the sector as well. So uh, DataKind have a UK chapter and it's aimed at nonprofit organisations who are wanting to work with their data. Um, and do data science and all that kind of thing. So there are communities of interest around this kind of thing. It's worth, um, if you're doing more with this, um, engaging with those. And then the other thing that is worth doing is uh, sharing data as widely as possible, internally and externally. So internally, one of the most powerful things that I've seen organizations do is uh, the dashboards that they've created for uh, them to use themselves, uh, printing them out every month and sticking them on the notice board uh, next to where people make coffee, just so that other people can see uh, can see that as well. It's very easy to uh, to walk into a venue and get a sense of how busy it is, and uh, and start to get a feel for that. The digital equivalent of that is tougher because you just don't see the other people that are on a website usually. So give people access to stats. It can be messy sometimes because people might draw the wrong, uh, the wrong conclusions from data sometimes. And that can be a little bit annoying, but I tend to see that there's a net benefit in people being able to understand the, uh, the data that relates to whatever it is they're trying to do uh, from time to time. You might take the approach of creating a dashboard specifically for someone so they can only see the data that's useful to uh, useful to them. Um, that's the uh, that's for you to think about. But give people give people access to this stuff. I've worked with marketing teams of very large museums who haven't been allowed a Google Analytics login and who are saying that they were putting out marketing activity. They just didn't know the impact of what they were doing. It boggles the mind. Um, so, so I would encourage you to share that stuff internally. Uh, I would also strongly encourage you to share externally as well. Um, the, the thing that I always tease um, website developers about who work in the cultural sector is that websites for museums, websites for theatres and so on, they're all essentially the same. Uh, the skeleton of these things are the same. Homepage, uh, what's on section, uh, a support us section, uh, an online collection bolted into a ticket ticketing system of some kind. The how it looks, you know, everyone's got their own color schemes and logos and things, but the skeletons all pretty much the same. Um, that's a little bit unfair, but in terms of reporting and analytics and so on, that's actually quite uh, quite useful. So I flagged up Wessex Museums here, which is uh, it's a kind of umbrella over uh, four museums in the Wessex area who uh, are constantly sharing information, um, uh, exhibition activity and training budget between them all. Uh, so 
Um, there might be others that you can buddy up with to get that, to make your uh, budgets go a little bit further. And I'd encourage you to do that. I think that makes uh, makes all the sense in the world. If one of our problems is that resource is lacking, then uh, then this is one way to overcome that. Uh, it is worth, if you have got an issue within your organization, this goes back to the communities thing as well, but asking other people to, uh, to help you out. And when you see other people asking, and if you can provide an answer, being generous with that, uh, as I was saying before, I think this sector is strongly dis uh, dispo disposed towards doing that anyway. Um, but this was uh, Culture 24's Let's Get Real project this, uh, this year, which was a cohort of... 40-something uh, organizations. Um, someone wanted to know um, how many downloads of learning resources they should expect to get from their website. They just didn't have the context um, uh, that others might have. So asked, and plenty of people were happy to give that information. So uh, getting that external context um, is a very valuable thing to do. And the other thing that I would encourage people to do is I mean, I'm sure you get bombarded with requests to do sector surveys, but I would do them. It is really valuable to be able to uh, to articulate to the rest of the sector uh, what's going on in a certain area. So the recent uh, DASH survey that the National Literary Heritage Fund, uh, Fund uh, put out, um, things like that. Uh, one further, um, we've got a program that we're um, uh, we're starting in the new year, which is about us being more generous and sharing more of what we do, uh, which is called Measuring the Museum. And part of that is a state of cultural content survey, which I'm sure you will be badged about very soon. I would encourage you to fill it out when it comes around. But giving yourselves this kind of context so that you're not just looking at your own numbers, but you're, you're able to look at the, uh, the uh, where you sit in the wider context as well. Super useful. Um, it is possible to do benchmarking uh, across other organizations. This is something that we do at one further for, uh, for some of our clients, but um, just sharing data with others so that you can understand how your, uh, in this case, your mix of different channels measures up with others. And uh, these graphs showing what's the, what's the balance of paid versus organic social traffic, um, understanding that your underspending compared to what others might be doing could be uh, could be valuable. Ooh. And then, so there's, there's all sorts of things that can contribute to the day to day, but understanding how this can fit into a sort of wider organizational context. It's about being strate strategic, um, which sounds a bit trite, I know, but uh, being strategic with your activity, um, first of all, involves understanding where you're starting from and uh, understanding your current position. So that is um, uh, the resources that you've got at your disposal, the subject matter areas that you're working in, um, the uh, understanding the skills within your organisation, having a good idea of that. What we're trying to get to is the place where we can start to answer these, what should we do questions? Where are the opportunities that we're not taking advantage of already? You can't really do it without understanding the bits lower down on this, uh, this pyramid. So you do need to have an understanding of what you're doing and, uh, and the whys. But you also need to break out of that um, as well to see these opportunities. So what you're looking for is opportunities to maximize whatever the strengths you've uh, identified. Hello, Lana. Uh, this is my daughter who would like to share a chocolate that she has found. Can, you, uh, can I come and uh, see that in a minute? Thank you. So the first thing is understanding what your uh, what strengths you've got that you can uh, you can really build on. It's about understanding uh, where your weaknesses are. So, for example, one of the weaknesses I've got is the lock on my office door. Um, understanding what you can do to, uh, to min minimize those and get over them. What you're then looking to do is, so if you're working day to day, you're probably looking to optimize individual activities in a fairly piecemeal kind of way. 
but from a strategic point of view, you need to be understanding how things chain together end to end. So it's not just about putting on uh, uh, an online, uh, doing a piece of uh, content online, like a new kind of experience. It's understanding what are the marketing channels and promotional levers that you're controlled to drive people there. And how is that going to benefit the organization at the other end in terms of uh, uh, sales, revenue, reputation, uh, increasing your email lists, uh, hitting targets that funders have set you around engaging with audiences that um, uh, don't fit your usual profile and, uh, and so on. And it's also about doing things that will create bigger, uh, bigger opportunities. It is quite hard to do this just using the data that you've got within um, uh, uh, within your own museums, and you do need to pick your head up and, and look at elsewhere for that context. So if one of our challenges is that um, we're lacking resource, then uh, finding funding and support has got to be one of the things that we're looking for to try and mitigate that. So, uh, so recently, the Arts Council, their um, capital investment uh, round, has announced that um, they will fund digital infrastructure to improve business performance, including data collection, collection and analysis. So it's not often that these kinds of opportunities uh, come along, so it's um, grabbing them uh, when you can. If one of the problems is that staff attraction and retention is a problem, uh, then, I mean, don't go to this extent. I don't think I'd want to work somewhere where everyone was uh, jumping around um, all day, every day. But um, uh, making your workplace somewhere that people can uh, grow, grasp opportunities and uh, develop themselves and that they are um, rewarded in terms of, well, if it can't be paid, if it can be recognition or, uh, or what have you. Uh, but, um, but making it um, uh, making our workplaces um, uh, better for uh, for people, so that um, the problems that we've got around uh, staff skills retention resource aren't uh, aren't made any worse, at least. And I think the other thing to look out is for is to understand the way that we're doing things, especially through our digital activity, and how they can be uh, rethought, recontextualized to break us out of the bubbles that we've got ourselves in already. So um, I have, um, uh, I've got a long rant that I sometimes do uh, about how um, cultural organizations have got social media totally wrong. They got off on the wrong foot. They, everyone went, uh, went around registering their um, organization's names on social media and dove themselves down uh, an organization centric uh, almost customer service based approach to everything, which totally limits the um, the opportunities that you've got and the reach that you're likely to have, except in a few small areas. I can do a longer version of this. I think it's worth looking at others who are taking different approaches and who are taking digitally native um, uh, approaches to what they're doing. So I'm currently obsessed with Artifacts Hub on uh, Twitter that, um, without having, having the backing of a large organization have managed to uh, amass uh, 685,000 followers by tweeting pictures of stuff from historical archives. Uh, fascinated by things like that and always collecting examples of others. What you tend to find is that many organizations are great, um, especially if they are doing talks on conference circuits and uh, so on. They'll be great in a specific area and not so strong elsewhere. They'll be using that as a beacon and um, uh, as the thing to, to rally their digital um, activity around. And so your strategic um, opportunity might be to find within the data, where is there something around your subject matter, um, your location, the kinds of audiences that you work with, where you've got an unfair advantage and doubling down on that and uh, and not worrying about uh, extraneous um, uh, extraneous noise. So I need to wrap things uh, wrap things up. I hope this has been a useful grab bag of uh, suggestions, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the uh, what kind of comments and questions you might have. But 
I think my, my getaways would be make sure you've got your foundations of your data um, sorted so that you are working from a reliable uh, starting point and that you haven't got uh, you haven't got people casting doubt on the data that you've got and that you're collecting useful data from people. Uh, it doesn't take much to, to, to make a start with uh, incorporating analysis into your uh, into your work. So do just think about starting uh, starting small. And thirdly, just do what the sector is predisposed to doing and uh, and share generously with others where you can. So um, uh, so fill out the surveys, ask other people for their numbers. Uh, give give other people uh, the numbers that you're working with as well. And as a sector, we can get stronger about how we're uh, how we're working with our data. So, thank you for allowing me to kick off the day. Uh, I'm at Chris Unit pretty much everywhere on the internet, um, uh, and OneFurther.com is where you can find the work that uh, the work that I do. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the talks and seeing what kind of comments and questions you might have. Hi, Georgina. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. So we do have some questions that have come through, but do carry on adding them, um, everyone, if you have more. So the first one um, came in from Mike Ellis, one of our lovely corporate members, um, who was asking, wondering if Chris could quickly talk to the ethical implications of gathering stats, particularly using Google. Should museums be moving their, um, I think he means, away towards tools that are less evil tracky? Um, I think that's something that an organisation needs to make on uh, a, a case by case basis. Um, I mean, we're in a situation now, there is very little you can do with uh, like s stepping a foot outside your front door without causing some harm to the world. So uh, in terms of the, uh, the data that you're collecting, I mean, there's certainly a responsibility to act uh, ethically with the personal data that you're collecting from people. Uh, whether you want to uh, to give money to uh, to Facebook, Google, and so on through their advertising tools, um, I think that's where the broader question is. Personally, uh, if you're using an analytics tool like Google Analytics, you're costing Google mon money. So I'm broadly on the side of uh, costing them as much money as you like. Um, uh, yeah. The, the, with most of these, I think I'm not going to give you a, um, uh, uh, a hard and fast answer on whether you should be using those things. It is worth knowing that for pretty much every tool that uh, Google and so on have created, there is an open source alternative, usually of poorer quality. Um, so if you're uh, if you are looking for that, then there are there are substitutes out there, except when it comes to advertising. Answer. Then we've got one in from Sophia, who's asked, how do cookies affect data tracking and what data can we still have access to and use when complying with GDPR? Uh, so that's a good question. So cookies um, have, and the approach to cookies have, um, that has come through legislative changes through things like um, uh, PECA, GDPR and other regulations um, means that you're having to ask people to opt in before you can uh, place identifiers on their browsers. A lot of these tools are already working with a sample of data anyway. So anyone using an ad blocker, for example, or not having JavaScript turned on on their browsers or what have you, uh, you're already not getting data uh, from those. The, um, the other side of this is what the browsers, um, things like Safari and Firefox and Brave and others are doing to uh, to reduce the amount of data collection going on. Uh, the, the advice that we, we're giving clients is that um, to understand that you're only ever going to be working with a sample of data anyway. Uh, anyone who's tried to report finance uh, revenue numbers from Google Analytics to people in finance functions will know that that doesn't go down very well because the numbers don't match up anyway. So understand that you're working with a sample of data. Um, you can still do plenty of comparative 
uh, analytics within that to understand uh, where the popular, what, what are the popular bits of content on your, on your website? What is your marketing mix and so on? I would also be, uh, I'm really big on getting people to do um, surveys of their audiences, putting a survey on your uh, ticketing confirmation page to ask people how easy was it to do that uh, transaction and is there anything that can be um, made easier? That kind of voice of customer stuff is, um, it's, it's really easy to make use of uh, when people are telling you this stuff. Usability testing as well. Um, so yeah, it's a shame we haven't got the, uh, the gospel truth on what some of our numbers are, but we never really had that in the first place. So just understand that it's a sample. Good stuff. Then one in from Rog McPherson, who's uh, who said ROI is not the best measure for most marketing or brand building um, campaigns, digital or otherwise. So what other top level measures are most likely to satisfy uh, trustees for greater investment in staff resources campaigns? Um, this is, I don't think we've got time to answer the <laughs> entirety of this question, but it's a good one. Thanks, Rob. Um, I think, uh, well, it's a mix of things that you're reporting on. I think um, revenue is never going to be the only thing that you're doing. Uh, a lot of, uh, I joke that cultural organizations always spend more money chasing the audiences that care the least about them than the dedicated audiences who will um, uh, who will um, come to everything that they're putting on. But the, so you've got to, uh, you've got to understand that mix. Some things will be, um, I think this also goes to the point that some of the evaluation that you're doing is going to be basically the um, the people that are experiencing the uh, the exhibitions or programs that you're doing are not the people paying for it, and that quite often it's uh, funders and foundations and others who are footing the bill, and they're the ones that you're reporting back to. Uh, I think that kind of that often ends up with some quite skewed priorities in uh, the kind of experiences that are um, that are that are measured and the kind of feedback that people are looking for. So, uh, so yeah, I mean that's just something to take into account as well. Um, I don't know. Maybe I need to write uh, a fully fledged article on uh, replying to Rob. Good question. Though. Great. So there's two minutes left. Those are all the sort of, I think, actual questions. There's been some interesting comments. So John Pratty commented that I would have thought that one of ACE's most important tasks as an impartial authority is that they should collect stats to show the museum um, content data landscape. And Mike said something similar about uh, in the early days of Google Analytics, it being much easier to, um, or there was much more talk about everyone pooling their data and then that never really happening. I don't know if you've got a perspective on who is best placed or, you know, whether we can go back to that time when it seemed much easier to kind of pool data um, at all. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to lay yet another thing at the Arts Council's mm. door and have them responsible for doing that. I mean. The, uh, I think one of the lovely things about the museum sector is that plenty of people are willing to pitch in on a volunteer basis. Um, uh, and that goes through to people working within museums, people who are interested in them, even like, I mean, one further is just, we're one of those horrible money grabbing consultancies, but even we do stuff that's uh, that's collaborative and, uh, and free to take part in. So the, uh, with our, um, partners Indigo and Baker Richards with part of this thing called the Insights Alliance that have been doing surveys around uh, audiences propensity to go back to venues and things. There's always been plenty of other people who will pitch in and uh, and do this kind of thing. Um, so I mean it's nobody's job, nobody's really incentivized to do it, but there are plenty of people who are interested. I've always been interested in this kind of, uh, kind of thing. So I think if you're looking for someone to pick that up as a job in the first instance it's it's just hoping that someone will get off their backsides and do it themselves rather than waiting for a funder because they're not always uh uh well they've got a i'm sure they've got a to-do list as long as their arms yeah it's not really their job either yeah brilliant well that is now half two 
Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for your questions. Um, it's now time, you can either take a break um, or there will be a queue for coffee, which I believe is in the sessions tab. Um, and it's just text the queue for coffee. There will um, in subsequent uh, breakout groups be a queue for cake, which is also um, video based networking. Um, and then if you want to regroup around 2.45 for the user experience panel.